hi to all of our Speak Up readers. We are here today sitting with Rachel Monroe, who is a writer and the author of Savage Appetites, Four True Stories of Women, Crime and Obsession, which explores women's relationship with uh, the true crime genre. She's also a contributing writer at magazines such as The Atlantic and The New Yorker. Rachel, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So let's get started. Um, according to your findings, what is it about true crime that attracts so many women? Uh, and what do the women who are drawn to the genre have in common, if anything, really? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's a it's a very simple question, and in some ways, it's a really big question. And I think that's when I first started looking into this, um, I was like, oh, there's a lot, there's a lot more here than I expected. Um, there are some people had written things out there, had kind of tried to give answers to that question, um, and they seemed to me to be like a little overly simplified. You know, people would say like, oh, women read about true crime because they want to learn tips to avoid. Um, being murdered by a serial killer and I was like well that's not quite it you know or um because you know women uh, women have so much empathy or something and and all of these um different ideas seem to be maybe a part a part of an answer or an answer for one person but not for another and so the more that I um was looking into it, the more I was like, oh, the, this is this is a question that deserves a whole book to answer because there are so many different kinds of true crime and there are so many different ways that um, readers and watchers and listeners interact with it. You know, true crime can be really, um, for some people, it can be all about learning about the criminal psychology and the fascination with that world and other people it's like much more the focus is much more on the kind of the detective side of things right like wanting to the the mystery aspect and the like crime solving the mm. the, the clues and the solutions um for some people it's much more about um thinking about justice and um i think that's you know, a lot of women have the experience of being maybe um, not believed or not listened to, or they're having their concerns dismissed. And so I think in some ways that makes them drawn to this, this idea of, uh, you know, miscarriage of justice or something like that. Um, and then there are the people who are, who are really like compelled by um, empathizing with the victims. And so like all of those different ways of relating to these stories, being interested in these stories. Um, there's a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of difference too. But I mean, the one thing that I did find consistent in in working on this book was that everybody that I spoke to who, you know, had a true crime podcast or worked for a true crime TV network or write, wrote true crime books, um, it was really consistent. They're like, the audience is like overwhelmingly female. Um, and so there, there really is like something there, but I think it's hard to sort of, it's hard to give a simple answer as to what it is. I have, a, I have a number of theories in the book, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 definitely. And um, going from there, uh, we see people give all sorts of reasons for why they are into true crime, like you said. Uh, one of these, though, is to seek justice for the victims, right? Uh, when you look at this, do you see an attempt to justify an otherwise sort of voyeuristic practice with a more morally acceptable motive? Uh, and if it is the case that our motives to get into true crime aren't based at least not fully on altruism, but simply say on the search for entertainment, uh, is that something we should be ashamed of? I think that's a really good question. And that's something that I turn over in my head a lot because I do think that um, for many people, maybe the majority of the true crime enthusiasts that I've that I've spoken to, um, you know, and I include myself in that, like I this is a genre that I spend a lot of time with. 
um, that motivation of like feeling connected to the victim, feeling empathy for the victim, wanting justice for the victim. That's like a very strong through line. I think for a lot of people and a lot of women um, who have experienced, who have been victims themselves in, in some way or another, you know, presumably not murder, but like victims of other kinds of exploitation of violence, um, of coercion, of manipulation. I think these stories um, can help us sort of understand and relate to and sort through those experiences in our own lives and and sort of uh, connecting with the victim is a way of connecting with those parts of ourselves that have been victimized, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in some ways there is a very, um, there can be something very um, important and very um, and very deep and very like psychological that goes on there like that with these stories, I think. I think that's that's very present. Um, but at the same time, I think that is also mixed with this sense of of voyeurism, like you said, this idea of um feeling almost entitled to know everything about a crime, you know, to uh, like really the most intimate details of a victim's life and the victim's death, mm -hmm. um, and feeling like, because I connect to this in some way, or I'm interested in it, or I'm drawn to it, um, it's it's somehow mine. Um, and that was that's kind of the point of the book. It's like it's all about women who feel this almost ownership over crimes that didn't happen to them. And you're like, wait, this wasn't you know, this didn't happen to you or your sister or anybody that you know. So why is it? Why is this? Why are you so obsessed with this? Like, what are you? What are you really obsessed with? And I think that. Um, when it crosses the line sometimes for me, yeah, the justification is often uh, I'm doing this, this is for the victim, this is on the victim's benefit, to the victim's benefit. But it, it if you look at it, it isn't really. I mean, I, I thought about this a lot. This happened after the book came out, but um, last year, was it last year? Gabby Petito, the young woman who um, was murdered by her boyfriend and, and was kind of, that was an unfolding case in the US for a while. And, and there were a lot of pictures of her. She was, you know, very prolific on social media and very beautiful and like such an awful story. Um, and, and you would, and there was just so many TikToks and like these enormous Facebook posts and Reddit posts and people were just like picking picking over her whole life and analyzing everything and her family and all of her friends and all of her relationships and and if you kind of push back on it at all you you know they would say no 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 it's it's justice it's justice for Gabby and I think I'm sure that element was there for some people, but I think sometimes that um, that idea of or that justification of you know we're doing this is for the victim is a is a shield to avoid um, thinking about um, some of the darker mot motivations. Um, and yeah. and often in these cases, you'll find you know the victims' families are saying you know like the the almost the the attention, particularly for these cases that get really big, the attention from the media and the true crime community um, can be really violating at a time when they've just suffered this incredible loss. Um, I think particularly sometimes on the internet, we seem to be able to forget that these stories are like that they happen to real people, you know, that these are not like characters on a, a TV show. We're not writing fan fiction that, you know, when you have, um, yeah that that like the the statements that you make and the all the the sort of obsessing like has a real life consequences for real people who've suffered a real loss mm, also somehow related to this maybe uh in terms of what is driving us right um do you think the explosive consumption of true crime we currently see has to do with the mental health struggles that are currently widespread uh, what is, if any, the connection between the two? Yeah, I think that's a very good insight, um, and that there are there are a lot of people struggling. I mean, that <laughs> excuse me, it was an interesting sort of through line in writing the book was and examining these different crime stories was like how often 
I could sort of see these these moments at which a person, a situation that that was bad, a relationship that was tense, um, got much worse when when the economic situation got worse, or somebody lost health insurance, or somebody lost a job, or somebody got sick, um, and and often that's sort of like the tipping point at which an uncomfortable or just kind of normally bad situation like tipped over into to really awful. And so I think that's for me, that's often like I found like what I'm what I'm reading for in these books is sort of to try to you uh, the crime happens and you're kind of trying to like walk it back and sort of be like, okay, when when could you see it? When did it begin? When when could you see when could the path have gone another way? Um and I think you know, again, for people who have experiences in their own life of, you know, dealing with people in crisis or dealing with um, situations that feel like they're spinning out of control, reading these stories helps you gain a perspective on your own life. It's almost like seeing the most extreme or amplified version of what an abusive relationship looks like helps you see the contours of it, you know, if, if they're there in your own life or in your own relationships. And so I do think that there's like this, this desire <clears throat> to, to understand, you know, like what is going on in people's heads when, mm -hmm. when they do really terrible things. And also because like, if by understanding it a little bit more, we can avoid it or solve it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Um, then a bit more personal mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a true crime you are yourself particularly obsessed with is there a specific mystery you'd wish to see solved the most like I feel like sometimes we like us who are into true crime like it, it, a lot of people you know do have that one or couple of stories that are yeah that they want to see solved that they want to see uh I think sometimes genuine justice you know for the victim um and yeah just just to see them um resolve you know within your own lifetime I guess yeah yeah do you have one I'm curious actually this is one that I actually you know I'm all for usually I'm all for well we don't have to justify everything we do this is very voyeuristic and that's okay but in yeah. this one instance I've actually you know, felt genuinely very bad and sad about the situation, um, particularly, and it's the case of Emanuele Orlandi, which is very mm. famous in Italy, and I think you've probably heard about, there's a huge Netflix uh, documentary now, so I think that would probably be mine, yeah. I think I, I sort of have two answers to that question, like the one that really, the, the story that's always obsessed me is the... Um, the Manson family and, and particularly the Manson girls. And I, I write about it a little bit in my book. Um, and that's that's not so much like I want, I think we're pretty clear on um, who did what, you know, there are various conspiracy, conspiracy theories um, that posit, you know, something more complex going on. But I, that's less, I'm less sort of drawn to that by the mystery of um, who did it than like, mm -hmm kind of wanting to understand how that could happen, how how people and particularly um, these young women could be drawn into this. Um, and I think part of the answer is they're so young. I mean, I got really obsessed with that case probably when I was around the same age as a lot of those girls, you know, like 16, 17, and um, feeling both like that I could relate to them and that there was like this chasm, you know, and I couldn't relate to them at all. And so that's always like mm -hmm. that kind of limit of identification is really fascinating for me. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, like cases, like unsolved cases, who did it getting the answer? I think the case of the West Memphis Three, which I write about a little bit in the book, um, because I spent a lot of time with them, um, the, the wife of one of the men who was wrongfully convicted um, in that case. Um, that's just a really sad story. These three young boys that were that were killed in the mm -hmm. woods um, and then three boys, you know, charged with mm -hmm. the crime and sent to prison for a crime that they didn't do. So you sort of have this, this compounding tragedy. And I think there's been um, understandably such a focus on um, getting those three men out of prison um, 
that sometimes there has been um, less attention paid on like, okay, well, if they didn't do it, then somebody did and, and they're still out there. And um, there's been a real resistance in that uh, case from the law enforcement um, in West Memphis and in the state to go over DNA evidence. Like they have DNA evidence that they're, they are resistant to test because I think they still maintain, you know, like, no, those, those three guys did it. We got the right guys and they don't want to, they don't want to open it back up because that might lead to questioning of, um, their own flaws, the exposure of the mistakes that they made. Um, and so it, that one feels like one that's very upsetting because like the, the potential for answers feels really close at hand, but, um, but the powers that be are sort of blocking those answers yeah. from arriving. And that's like really frustrating. And you just think about, you know, it's, it's destroyed the families of these three boys as, as it would anybody and, and the town. And uh, yeah, that's one I would really love to see answers on. Mm -hmm. And do you see um, the huge kind of politicization, like there's there's some kind of hyper politics at the moment, it feels uh, in the like public sphere in general, uh, definitely in the US, which is where you're from. Um, and I don't know, I guess, uh, do you see true crime somewhere, like falling some, somewhere in this? um momentum let's say uh we don't have to establish whether it's positive or bad or like you know we, sure. we don't need to like draw a massive conclusion about what is the what are the best politics ever yeah. uh, how or how to you know get them across even but uh i was wondering is true crime does it fall some somewhere in this you know what i mean yeah that's interesting i mean some of the it was funny because like some of the um like just a handful of people um, like on Amazon or whatever reviewed my book and was like, oh, I, I like the book, but like too much politics in this book about crime. And, and it was funny to me because I was like, crime stories are almost always like so, so political in this idea that you could go to a book um, about crime and expect it to like not have any politics. And it was like really kind of funny to me. Um, but because I was interested in like not, there's a political aspect to um the factors that you know cause crime mm -hmm. and crime rates and trends in crime but then there's also kind of more interesting to me um because I'm not like a criminologist is the way that certain cases like get get used and get picked up and um certain crimes get get amplified and get a ton of attention and other crimes like get ignored or get no intention, no attention at all. Um, and I think that's like you, we start to see um, the politic politicization of um, certain of these like big sensational crimes. I mean, I write about that a little bit in the book, like starting, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, this, this idea, this sort of crime panic that was, mm -hmm. um, that was like stoked by the, the Reagan administration. And, and there was a big crime spike then, but the, the, the victims who got sort of like picked to be featured and the people who were kind of invited to imagine themselves as victims, um, generally like middle-class white people versus who was actually being victimized by crime. Um, and so I do think that like, because crime stories are so visceral, you know, they really like get us at, at this very kind of deep, immediate level, they can be really effective political tools. And so they can, they can often like be, um, and, and politicians understand that. So they, so they use them. Um, and, and it's funny because you'll see like, if you, depending on what magazines you read or what, you know, news channels you watch, like some crimes will be covered over and over and over again. And then you, you know, you turn to the, the, uh, the channel with the other politics and it's not there at all. You know, it's just like, what gets the attention? Yeah, you, you mean it's basically being used for uh, whichever purpose the given person has. and Yeah, like a symbolic purpose. I mean, I think, you know, the, there was um, there was a, a really sad case here um, maybe a decade ago of a young woman who was killed by a stray bullet, like a guy. I, I don't remember the circumstances. He wasn't trying to shoot her, but the bullet, like she was killed. 
Um, and it was a man who was like in the country illegally. And Donald Trump made a huge thing about this and would talk about it in all his speeches. You know, this young woman, like beautiful young blonde girl, like killed by an illegal immigrant, you know, say this over and over again. And her family was like, please don't do this. You know, this is like traumatizing to us. We don't want you to like make our daughter's tragedy like into, you know, like your political speech. But it was a very kind of convenient story for the the rallies um and so in that way it sort of took on a life of its own as like the symbolism of it that got kind of detached from from the reality of of her experience and her family's experience so like those you know those stories can really travel no and it's at the end of the day obviously like when we talk about true crime we can't ignore the true crimes <laughs> like right. we're talking about our genre but um I really love what you did there which is you know you kind of highlighted how these are real crimes actually <laughs> that's kind of the point and obviously once that's true then they are going to be used um in all sort of ways um and I'm sure there can be good that comes out of it uh, but obviously not in the case that you just mentioned which is yeah just a clear example of uh the manipulation that gets done um and yeah, so these were basically our questions. Uh, I love true crime, honestly. Yeah, uh, me too, obviously. Yeah, I mean, oh, we obviously love it. Um, anyway, yeah, this was kind of um, your your view on, on the whole topic and you have an expert one. So we are very happy uh, to have had you here. Uh, thank you so much. And yes, please keep uh, investigating on this. Uh -huh. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. I could talk about this stuff forever. So it was a pleasure. For us too. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too.